So now it's time for the afternoon, and we're fortunate enough to hear about some non-traditional programming. Um, these are holistic and innovate, innovative approaches to youth sports. And our pa panelists are Karen Kafer from Gen Youth, Bethany Rubin and Henderson from America Scores, and Julia Pines from Girls in the Game. And so let's welcome them. Good afternoon. Right. <laughs> I'm Karen Kafer, and I'm a registered dietitian and senior vice president of health partnerships for Gen Youth. I'm really honored to be here to share some of our insights and experience that we think will help inform the important work that you're doing on the National Youth Strategy. Uh, Gen Youth is a nonprofit organization that equips, empowers, and engages youth to be champions for healthier future for themselves and for their peers. We convene diverse stakeholders of public and private sectors from tech companies like SAP, to the Rockefeller Foundation, to the Quaker Oats Company, to raise funds for youth initiatives that bolster healthy, high achieving students, schools, and communities. And we have a range of national programs, including the largest in-school health and wellness program called Fuel Up to Play 60. It's a unique program or a program developed through a unique partnership between farmers, football players, and the federal government, uh, including the National Dairy Council, the National Football League, and the USDA. It reaches 73,000 schools and 38 million students nationwide focused on improving healthy eating and physical activity. Today we wanted to talk about our Fuel Up to Play 60 NFL Flag in Schools program, which is equipping thousands of schools with equipment, curriculum, and training to increase physical activity. Through our experience in schools for about 10 years with Fuel Up to Play 60, we identified a big interest and huge demand for high quality turnkey solutions for physical activity that could be used before, during, and after school. Our own research revealed that the biggest barriers to physical activity outside the classroom are funding for resources, lack of appropriate play space, and the need for adult leaders, some of what you've heard this morning. So in 2014, the NFL and Gen Youth partnered to support America's PE teachers with free resources to help students build a foundation of healthy, lifelong physical activity through flag football, which now is the fastest growing sport, team sport, for youth ages 6 to 12. Each kit allows students to get active and learn about football, but in a fun environment. I'm really proud to share that the FLAG uh, program meets three important needs, and I think that's why we found it to be successful. One FLAG is a turnkey solution. It's also very cost effective, it's scalable, sustainable, and it's also customizable for play space, which I was brought up as an important issue. We provide flag kits free to schools thanks to partners like the NFL Foundation, United Healthcare, and Nike for $1.14 per student in the first year of use with a lifespan of about five years. Secondly, FLAG is a catalyst for growing opportunities for physical activity. 98% of our schools say that they use their FLAG kits before, during, and after school, and even on weekends. And this is under the guidance of trained adult leaders. We continue to experience significant year-over-year -year growth of FLAG in PE classes, and over half of our survey respondents say that they began their after-school program after they received their FLAG kit. And lastly, FLAG is inclusive. We know that FLAG engages not only boys, but also girls, 
and importantly, socioeconomically disadvantaged and minority youth. Now we learned that the need for turnkey solutions is really high and the demand has far exceeded our ability to supply, but we hope to continue to do so. Since our program began, we've provided kits to a total of 16,385 schools. Now that's about 16% of schools nationwide. The kits cost $375 and they include 10 footballs, 10 youth footballs, 50 flag belts, three kicking tees, an NFL flag poster, participant certificates, and a flag football curriculum developed with Shape America to meet national standards. Since the inception of the program, as you'll see, we've grown it to reach over 9 million students. And in 40% of our schools in the program, Hispanic students make up at least 20% of the student body. And another third of the schools, African American youth, make up at least 20% of all students. Now, probably the number one question we get about flag is, but what about girls? Do they really like flag? And I'm here to tell you that they love flag, just as boys. This is a busy chart, but I wanted to share. It's a great example. Miami-Dade Public Schools, which is one of the largest school districts in the country and about 70% Hispanic, is a great case study to show the interest in and the sustainable growth of flag among girls. And I have to give a shout out to Dr. Jane Greenberg. I know she's probably listening in. She's the former district PE director for Miami-Dade, currently now at HHS, who has been a big champion for flag and growing flag, uh, girl flag leagues. I'm very excited that this year we are developing a high school curriculum produced in partnership with Shape America with additional emphasis on getting even more girls in the game. Also this year, we're distributing an additional 5,044 kits to school communities that will reach 2.7 million students. Within that total, we're pleased to be providing 500 kits to girls and boys schools, uh, girls and boys clubs across the country. We'll be providing uh, kits to all the girls schools in New York City, which is where we are based. We've trained thousands of educators, and next week at the Shape America Annual Convention, we'll be training 200 more PE teachers in attendance. Now, before I continue, I'd like to show you a short video, because I think it helps bring the, bring the program to life and make the point that flag isn't all about football, which is what people often think, and it's not even about exercise, but about kids having fun, being physically active. Let's take a look. This doesn't, there we go. <laughs> well, as you can see from the video, the kits can be used for much more than playing flag, and they help to develop agility, aerobic capacity, and get kids moving. As we look ahead, we could plan to continue our work to reduce barriers and increase participation, and we think flag can do that in several ways. One indicator of our program's success in reducing barriers is that 71% 
of our kits go to high need school communities, meaning that, <clears throat> excuse me, 40% or more of the students in those schools qualify for free and reduced price meals under USDA's nutrition program. Also, as we saw in the video, flag kits encourage vi vigorous physical activity, but they don't require any extensive training, skill, or natural talent. Students participate at no financial cost, ensuring that the program does not create an economic barrier. And since the kids are provided to schools free of charge, the relative benefits are greatest for those schools that are challenged with resources. At Gen Youth, we're also passionate about measurement and evaluation. We track demand, distribution, utilization through reports and surveys with our schools. In addition, we work collaboratively with specific school districts, with USA Football and the NFL to conduct targeted surveys with educators about the program use, impact, and opportunities for improvement. I also wanted to mention that we garner and publish youth insights on youth wellness. Uh, we believe that the youth voice is important in informing our programs. In the coming school year, the NFL Foundation has committed to build on six years of support with generously providing a new, renewed grant. This will support 4,200 more flag kits, reaching 1.4 million new students within all 32 NFL club markets. The grant will also allow us to update and enhance our curriculum, including the female-focused high school curriculum that I mentioned. And importantly, we are collaborating with HHS's I Can Do It program to create a customizable and inclusive resource aimed at providing flag activities for the underserved population of students with disabilities. Lastly, we'll be strengthening our knowledge and insights with respect to school and community utilization and impact and be providing a report on those, that data. In closing, schools and communities, we all know, need our help. We also, we have learned that kids love flag. By promoting and supporting turnkey solutions like flag, encouraging public-private partnerships to fund PE sources, the federal government would be leveraging a successful model to effectively reduce barriers and increase participation in youth sports that advance physical activity. So again, we know that FLAG, we've learned, is a turnkey solution. It's cost effective, scalable, sustainable, and customizable. Secondly, it's a catalyst for growing fun opportunities for physical activity before, during, and after school. And it's inclusive, engaging both girls and boys, and importantly, socioeconomically disadvantaged and minority youth. So I want to thank you for listening and for the opportunity to present uh, NFL Flag in Schools as a non-traditional program with proven success in engaging youth to improve physical activities in school communities across the country. Thanks. I don't really do podiums all that well, so I'm going to stand over here. I'd like to start by telling y'all a story. So it was another beautiful day in D.C. like this about four and a half years ago, and I was standing outside the White House with a handful of America Scores soccer players and a couple of soccer coaches. These kids were about 10 years old, you know, yay high, 9, nine 10, 11 year old kids, fifth graders, and they had spent the day inside the executive office building the Eisenhower Executive Office building. They went gone bowling. They'd literally been kicking soccer balls through the halls. We were there as part of the What's, What Works showcase for the Social Innovation Fund at the time. So we'd been there for like six hours. Every group that was showcasing something pulled them and said, hey, show our sport. Hey, show our sport. Hey, show our sport. So the kids had had a full day of literally running around inside the building. And as we're standing outside of the White House afterwards, looking back through the gates, I asked them, what are you going to take away from today? You know, what really matters to you? 
And this one little girl, Jensi, looks up at me with these big brown eyes and says to me, I'm going to remember that people care about me. Sports and sports teams are so much more than the physical activity benefits that kids get. When you really think about what the power of sports teams are and what sports can do, is that they are truly transformative into kids' lives. So I'm with America Scores. I'm Bethany Henderson. I'm our network president. And I'll talk more about our model in a moment. But I want to start by talking about the kids that we work with, kids who very rarely have access to organized sports. In fact, the kids we work with, the 3,000 kids here in DC, more than half of their families tell us that without scores, their kids would not have any other opportunity to actually play on a sports team at all. So who are these children that we work with? This is our scope, so it gives you a sense of where America Scores is around the US. But who are these kids? Well, these are kids who face real life challenges every day by virtue of the neighborhoods that they live in, by virtue of family circumstances. They are in schools that are far underperforming. Three quarters of the kids and their peers are not on grade level in any subject at any grade. Right? These are kids who are starting out with not just you know, one hand, two hands, but both hands and both legs tied behind their backs. Right? They're not starting out from a level playing field. These are kids for whom sports, as longtime educator Charles Robinson, who works down the street in a DC public school, and this man's been teaching and working in schools for 40 years. He's been coaching youth sports that entire time as well. He's been coaching for scores for 20 years. As he says to me the other day, you know, when I think about youth sports, for many kids, they're icing. They're important. You learn a lot. They're meaningful. For my kids, my scores kids, they're not icing. They're a lifeline. They are what keeps them on track. And youth sports can be a lifeline for kids with incredible sports talent. Kids like Precious, who has been called up to college ID camps at the age of 15. Kids like Bridget, out in the Bay Area in our program there, who was called up to the US Women's National Team, the under 14 national team. Kids like Edgar, who's now at Princeton. Kids like Christian, who just graduated from the DC Central Kitchen Chef program. Kids like Ingrid, who's a first generation college student, and tens of thousands of others like them. Every single one of these kids, what they have in common, was that they were part of a SCORES sports team and that they had that team and their coaches with them, and we do soccer, not just when they were eight or nine or 10, but that that team stuck with them. And ultimately that identity is being part of a team and it's why I always wear our t-shirts out because these are the same jerseys our kids wear because it is part of their identity. It is part of how they identify I belong to something. I belong to something bigger than me. And all of these kids are actually still physically active. Jensi's now a high school soccer player, right? Christian now coaches at our summer camps. Bridget and Precious are playing and competing for college. But ultimately for them, the sport matters because it's that vehicle to that lifeline of that team. So as we think about why more of these kids are not playing sports and more of the kids that America Scores works with and the type of kids don't have access, there's unfortunately a large number of barriers. And they're not barriers I had to face in my life. And they're not barriers my own children have to face. And they're not barriers many of us think about if we're not living them. But the realities for our kids is that simply getting to that playing field is tough. So what are these barriers? Well. There's a huge pay-to-play infrastructure in this country. I mean, particularly in the sport of soccer, which is what SCORES does. Pay-to-play immediately boxes out kids who can't afford that. There's physical inaccessibility. Let's say that you can't. Let's say there are scholarships, as I think was talked about earlier this morning. That doesn't mean the kid can actually get themselves, or their families have the ability to get them to that practice, to that game day, especially if there's no public transit. Parents and guardians might be unavailable to move them around town. They might be working. They might not be there. That's the realities for the kids that we work with. Immediate family needs. What we see over and over, I was out in one of our fields yesterday, and there were several little bitty kids, yay, hi, out there on the field to the game day. And I said to the coach, oh, are these siblings? He says, absolutely. Right? So America Scores works primarily with 8 to 14-year-olds, and I have yet to go to an America Scores program site where there is not some younger sibling hanging out. Why? Because that 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old is responsible for childcare for that kid. That only exacerbates as the kids get older. Or the need for teenagers to work to support their families. These are not kids whose reality is that they can go to two or three or four practices a week, right? They have family responsibilities that are much more adult. 
And then oftentimes we run into cultural norms. We have work with communities, many immigrant communities, where the concept is girls don't play, right? Sports are not for girls. Or when they get to a certain age, that's not what they should be doing. So there's all of these barriers that keep kids from even starting to play in the first place. Now, there's ways to reduce these barriers, but they take what the first panelist talked about this morning, very intentional, not just program design, but program implementation to actually carry off, right? As I say, it's not for the faint of heart. You can't just sort of like drop in a coach and say, all right, go, you're good. So what are some of these strategies? One, making programs free and putting them in kids' neighborhoods. So all of America Scores pro programming is free. We do not charge families to participate. We operate inside kids' school buildings and in their neighborhood rec centers, meaning that kids do not have to have transportation to get to games, to get to practices. Their parents don't have to have transportation. Their siblings can come with them because they don't have to have transportation. They are physically accessible. We're going to where the kids are, not making them come to us. Two, structuring the program to account for the kid's reality. So whether that be, sure, your, you know, your sibling can hang out on the sideline, or we work in the after school hours, right? So we give the parents an extra couple of hours where they know their kids are safe. I don't know how many of you know this, after school program and access is not universal either. Here in Washington, D.C., there's a huge gap between the number of kids who need after school programs and the number of after school seats there are, even if you can afford to pay for them, right? So for working parents, creating that space where they know the kids will be safe, meeting the kids where they are, understanding that they might have had a rough day, that they may not speak the same language as the coach, that they may not know the sport, that there may be a million other things going on in that kid's life that makes them show up at that field angry, checked out, having an issue, and meeting them where they're at, focusing on that youth development aspect. Partnering with principals and teachers. So there's a lot of benefits for youth sports in the classroom. Right? There's a lot of research that shows what increased physical activity does in terms of kids' performance academically, in terms of kids feeling connected to their community. And what we do at America Scores is really we work, we actually hire, train, and pay school teachers and school staff to deliver our programming. They do second shift with us. And this is really important because a lot of you sports programs rely on volunteers and we do not. And it's very intentional. We do not because it allows us to control program quality. We do not because we need to make sure that we have coaches who can meet the kids where they are at. Coaches who come from those kids' communities, who understand the realities of their daily life, who understand the struggles those kids are facing, and who can get to know those families. I spend a lot of time educating our principals that we partner with on the value of sports and academics and how they connect in their building because we work in school buildings on sports and behavior, right? We always say we don't want you to punish a kid for bad behavior by not letting them be physically active. That's exactly the opposite thing what you, little kids that age need, especially if they're having behavioral issues. And leveraging those after school hours and the out of school time program partners like SCORES. Community based coaches, right? Making sure that the coaches are intentionally prepared to work with the kids they're working with. Not just that they're technically skilled and proficient in the sport. That's not enough. But training coaches in things like social emotional learning, in trauma-informed coaching. We actually had a situation a couple years ago where a, about a 12-year-old kid was really struggling with their gender identity. And it was a community where that was not an okay thing. And after struggling with it for a while, that child went to their soccer team and their coach, our soccer team, and sat down and said, I have something to tell you, and shared their story and the amazing thing was the team embraced the kid, the coach embraced the kid, the school ended up embracing the kid, the child transitioned from the girls team to the boys team in keeping with their gender identity. And the coach called us and said, man, am I so glad we had training about this stuff recently <laughs> because I felt like I actually had some ability to be present with that child and had tools to know what I was supposed to be able to do to help them. To be able to meet kids where they're at is not something you can drop an untrained coach in, no matter if they have children themselves, right? And that's kind of how we treat youth coaching. We're like, oh, good, you have kids, you can coach, right? We wouldn't do that with school teachers. We wouldn't do that with doctors. We wouldn't do that with therapists. But for some reason, coaches who have an outsized influence in kids' lives, how many of you had a coach that mattered in your life tremendously? I know I did, right? We kind of assume, all right, well, they can just be volunteers. We can drop them in and they'll figure it out as they go doesn't work particularly when sports teams are a lifeline, not just icing. And last but not least, especially when you're working with families where kids have competing demands like childcare, like 
needing to earn money, making sure that there are real tangible benefits that the kids and their families experience as part of that sports team, that they're recognizing success early and often. They don't have to be big tangible benefits, they don't have to be I lost 15 pounds, you know, but something that feels like a win every time that can be celebrated. So the America Scores model, so we build teams and we take a holistic approach. We build teams and every soccer team an America Scores program plays in our soccer leagues. That same team writes and performs original poetry. That same team designs and carries out service projects in their community. It's mind, body, and soul. Kids who come for poetry have to do soccer and discover that they're athletes. Kids who come for soccer and don't think that they have anything worth sharing find their voice. Kids who think that they can't actually affect the world around them find their agency. And it's by having those same teams of kids do everything together, coached by the same adult, is what keeps kids coming back. And we know this works. So in a year with America scores, you see a lot of things, right? You see a lot of soccer games. You see a lot of teams. You see a lot of poems written. And that's all great. The kids are having that experience. You can see it in action. If you came out to our program, you go, oh, okay, that looks like a youth soccer game. Who cares? And I'd say, exactly. Because the kids we work with deserve to have that same experience, quality sports programming, as kids whose parents can happen to afford to pay to play. But you also know it works because we have academic impacts. We have measurable physical fitness impacts. We have measurable mental health, social, emotional impacts. And most importantly, we've heard the term fun come up several times already today. The program is fun. Kids come back year after year over and over again. And that's where the real impact comes from because they embed with their team. Because if I walk down the street wearing this t-shirt or I'm in the metro or I walk into a store, I cannot tell you the number of times that someone leaps up and goes, oh my God, America scores, DC scores. I was in DC scores in blah, blah, blah school, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's part of the core identity that kids attach to. And when they attach to that identity of I'm an athlete, guess what happens? They keep staying physically active. They keep playing sports. So. As I think ahead about how the government can help, how the President's Council can help, how HHS can help, there's a couple of things that are really, really important. One is elevating, elevating this issue. In order for youth sports to spread, especially in the communities that we work in, they gotta be fun. They gotta be free. You gotta have trained coach mentors. The programming has to be high quality. It can't be poor quality just because it's free. You gotta have easy on-ramps to success, right? Soccer is an easy on-ramp sport. You don't need a particular body type. You don't need a particular skill. You don't you know, need to have any particular gear, right? You show up, someone can throw out a ball, and that's it. That's why it's such a popular sport in the world. You need to have easy on-ramps to success and regular celebrations. The power of a team matters a lot, and embedding sports within a whole child program keeps kids feeling connected, coming back, and building those peer and adult relationships that really, really matter. And finally, the importance of meeting kids where they're at. So elevating these issues. Two, funding. You've heard about funding today. All right, our programming's free. How do we fund it? It's not government funded. We're grant funded. We have to re-raise our budget from scratch every single year. We serve 15,000 children around the city. We provide over 200, 2 million child hours of programming. We're with kids five days a week. I heard the statistic earlier today about $400 a season for a youth sports program. That's like a day or two a week plus games. We are 12 weeks, five days a week, paid coaches doing it for that same amount of money. But we're not getting it from the parents. So directing funding to this effort. And last but not least, coach training and the importance of coach training, coach training standards, creating some sort of certifications that's not about the sport technicality, there's a lot of that already, but about the youth development aspect, about how do you really grow children, the sacred trust that coaches are given to work with kids. So I'll close out with the why. You know, why do we do this? Why, do we, why does it matter? And it matters because of kids like Catherine. I know it's hard to read this, so I'll just close out. Catherine says, I started playing with Boston scores when I was sixth grade at Amana Academy. My favorite memory is when the high school team was first created because it gave me the opportunity to continue playing soccer when my school season ended. I personally benefited because it gave me many opportunities like jobs and meeting new people. I also get to help younger athletes in my neighborhood, which I love. All kids deserve a role model like Catherine. Thank you. Hi everyone, 
So when I was a kid, I played basketball for several consecutive years and can confidently say that throughout those years, I never got any better. However, I loved playing and it sparked my interest in trying new sports as I grew up, including lacrosse, track, and cross country, which are all sports that I also was never very good at. Even if I was not the MVP, I gained many life lesson skills and friendships through sports, and I believe every girl deserves the same opportunity. I'm so excited to be a part of the youth sports community and thankful for that opportunity to tell you about my organization, Girls in the Game. My name is Julia Pines, and I've been with Girls in the Game since 2017 as their Baltimore City Coordinator. At Girls in the Game, every girl finds her voice, discovers her strength, and leads with confidence through fun and active sports health and leadership programs. Girls in the Game was established in Chicago, Illinois in 1995 and has since expanded to the several locations you see here. We offer elementary, middle, and high school programs for girls 7 to 18 years old of any background or race. Last year, throughout all of our programs, 51% of girls identified as black or African American, 29% as, as Hispanic or Latina, 4% as white, and 16% as two or more races or other. According to the Middle School Journal, socialized gender, gender roles influence the career aspirations of young girls, and single-sex environments increase their self-confidence, broaden their career options, and mitigate some power of gendered messages. Unfortunately, opportunities for sports and leadership are scarce, especially for girls in underserved communities. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the need for girl-focused sports programming, but on the left, you can see st statistics specific to girls in the game teen participants. This information is what motivates us to provide a safe, all-girl environment where the, um, sorry, where the need is the highest. With girls in the game, girls feel com comfortable developing the skills they need to lead confident, healthy lives and engage with the topics most important to them. With the guidance of our coaches, girls get out of their comfort zones and learn traditional sports, such as soccer and volleyball, and non-traditional sports, such as yoga and cardio kickboxing. Our programs are designed so that girls get involved at a young age and stay involved through high school. Our belief, in the, our belief in the power of girls fuels our organization. Here you can see the ways we're creating safe spaces for girls and teens to be themselves and discover their voice, strength, and leadership. But I want to talk more about our whole girl approach, which refers to our method of integrating our sports curriculum with health and leadership topics. We recognize that the benefits of sports extend beyond health and wellness and can be formative in building crucial life skills. In addition to physical activity, healthy eating, and body image, we address health and leadership topics such as diversity, conflict resolution, healthy relationships, and community awareness. All topics that are significant but not necessarily addressed during school hours. We aspire to create leaders who are unafraid of sharing ideas, expressing their opinions, and affecting change in their communities. Our unique whole girl approach ensures that girls leave confident and healthier. So these are the programs we have nationally, and while I don't have time to tell you about all of them, I want to tell you more about our after school and teen programming. Our after school program refers to our weekly elementary and middle school program. Both meet once a week for 90 minutes over 10 weeks. Throughout the 10 weeks, Elementary school girls learn three sports, three health, and three leadership topics. And the final week is Friends and Family Day, where girls can showcase their new favorite skills. Middle school is more leadership focused and a bit more autonomous as girls vote on the topics they would like to learn about. We, we also offer uh, several teen programs. First, we have our citywide teen squads, where teens attend leader-to-leader -leader interviews with panels of professionals to learn more about their fields of work. Teens also learn to lead workshops for younger girls and earn scholarship money for college based on their participation. We also have site-based teen clubs at schools, community centers, and residential programs that meet weekly and follow an 11-week sports health and leadership curriculum. We're really excited to be growing our programs locally in Baltimore. Since we expanded to Baltimore in 2015, we've had elementary after school programs at six schools, and just um, teen programs at two schools, and just started our first Baltimore middle school program this semester. This school year, we also started game days that occur the first Saturday of every month. During game days, girls participate in one hour of sports or fitness activities, and one hour of interactive workshops on health, leadership, and general life skills. Game days are taught by volunteer guest coaches who are experts in the sports or given topics. Some guest coaches from this, this year include the field hockey coach from Goucher College, a Tau the Towson Club volleyball team, a local yoga instructor, and a local dance teacher. 
Our weekly programs are led by our staff and wonderful volunteer coaches. Since our programs occur during or after school, right during typical workday hours, college students with flexible schedules are prim primarily coach our programs. Since Girls in the Game's arrival to Baltimore, we've had a strong partnership with Towson University, specifically their Office of Women and Gender Studies. Um, a majority of our volunteer coaches in Baltimore are students at Towson, um, in addition to some from Morgan State University. From kinesiology majors to education majors, many compassionate college students are drawn to the work we do and are eager for opportunities to coach younger girls. To recruit coaches, we utilize department, lister, department listservs, community engagement web pages, and spread the word to community service classes as well. We also spread the word to ver various campus organizations, use volunteermatch.com, local neighborhood groups in Baltimore, and reach out to our auxiliary board. In addition to completing our volunteer application, a background check, and various certifications, volunteer coaches must attend our four-hour best practices training. At this training, coaches learn about our guiding theories and perspectives, including the essentials of trauma-informed, strengths-based, and systems-focused care. Coaches also learn about our behavior ma management policy, guidelines to maintain professional boundaries, and spend plenty of time practicing our curriculum. We implement a lot of incentives for our coaches. For example, we have photo contests or social media post contests in which coaches can win prizes. At Girls in the Game, our programs are working. We evaluate our programs annually through a 12-year par partnership with Lo Loyola University of Chicago to confirm that we are meeting our mission and goals. Our evaluation results from last year indicate that after one season of after school, 89% of girls in increase their leadership abilities and 78% of girls chose to be more active in their free time. Girls also learned how to use nonviolent conflict resolution strategies and 84% maintained or increased their ability to do so after just one season of programming. After one season of Teen Squad, 87.5% of members reported that they were a role model and 100% of participants maintained or increased their leadership scores. The majority of participants correctly answered questions about the recommended frequency of exercise and the types of food they should eat in a meal to be healthy. After our programs, teen participants also reported be being more active in gym class and feeling more future-oriented in their thinking. We also evaluate data pertaining to new members versus participants who have repeated our programs. Girls who repeat after-school programming are more likely to stand up for what they believe in, participate in class, see themselves as hard work workers, and exhibit higher grit. 77% of girls who completed three set seasons of elementary and middle after-school programming maintained or increased their valuation of self-worth, and teens in their second year or more of Girls in the Game programming reported a greater sense of belonging than teens in their first. So I know we talked a bit about barriers. So barriers that prevent girls in Baltimore City from participating in new sports include lack of opportunity, lack of space, and transportation and safety concerns. When caregivers are unavailable to provide transportation, girls in Baltimore often do not have a safe way to get around, and public transportation isn't always an option. At Girls in the Game, our programs are completely free for schools and participants, and weekly programming is site-based, so we meet girls where they are. Our Saturday game days are at Living Classrooms UA House, which is a state-of-the-art recreation center centrally located between most of our schools, and we provide transportation for any field trips. In my experience, barriers to participation that we commonly see at Girls in the Game are academics. If girls are not performing well in school, they may not be able to attend programming at the request of an administrator, or tutoring and homework might take precedence. Um, sometimes conflicts with peers jeopardize participation during program, programming or prevent girls from coming entirely. Technology is a common barrier. As we all know, social media can be a major distraction, especially with middle school and teen participants. Some girls have other responsibilities, including jobs and sibling care that occur during our program times. Of course, participation is crucial for our programs. In my experience, I've learned that youth sports programming is not one size fits all. Girls in the Game curriculums, curriculums are the same nationally. However, we, ad, we value adaptability and flexibility as we continue to expand in new cities. While our mission stays the same, we recognize the uniqueness of each city and the amazing girls with whom we serve. We utilize a number of strategies to improve and maintain participation in our Baltimore programs. First, we have a regimented structure of weekly programming. Between stressors at school and at home, we recognize that participants have a lot going on in their lives, and we aim to be a source of consistency for them. 
prog our programs occur on the same day at the same time with the same coaches and programming sessions follow the same general schedule. When girls enter our program space, they're reminded of the girls in the game five finger contract, safety, commitment, respect, team effort, and we, if we follow all of those guidelines, we always have fun. Um, we also, sorry, we also implemented, um, we also provide various incentives for girls. All participants receive Girls in the Game t-shirts, and most importantly, healthy snacks at every programming session. We end each elementary and middle school session by awarding a girl as Athlete of the Day, given to someone who showcased our five-finger contract and was a leader and team player during programming. We also established the Saturday game days that I mentioned previously. Providing weekend programming has been a great opportunity for girls from all across our Baltimore programs to meet and form friendships with each other and the guest coaches on days when they otherwise might not have meaningful activities going on. Another strategy we use to improve participation is building community partnerships. We often engage with like-minded organizations to learn more about their initi initiatives in Baltimore and find ways to partner and extend our reach together. We are continuing to build strong relationships with Baltimore schools, communities, and philanthropic partners to provide vital and informed programming for a diverse community of girls. Our Baltimore Auxiliary Board, comprised of mostly women who are diverse in backgrounds, is crucial to the growth of our network. Auxiliary Board members often volunteer at programming and serve as strong role models for our participants. Another method of improving participation in our programs that we deeply value at Girls in the Game is establishing strong relationships with the girls we serve and their families. Girls in the Game is a trauma-informed organization, which means that we, our staff and volunteers, recognize that there may be a high prevalence of trauma in our participants' lives, and that behavior issues arise from situational and contextual factors. We're also a strengths-based organization, so we always use empowering language rather than language that is objectifying or stigmatizing. We provide girls with choices and autonomy and a safe space for them to be active, build their confidence, but take breaks when they need them. The bond between our coaches and participants is important. Not only are coaches there to lead programming, they become role models as well. If girls miss a day of programming, we always follow up with, we missed you phone calls, and make sure to call caregivers and school contacts regarding successes in programming. During the recruitment process, we always reach out to girls who have participated in our programs during previous season, seasons to keep them involved long term, in addition to recruiting new participants. We also, we also try to involve girls in multiple programs per year. Last year, throughout all of our programs, 403 girls participated in more than one Girls in the Game program throughout the year. Um, as a systems-focused organization, we understand that we are just one piece of the puzzle and establishing relationships with our participants, their families, schools, and communities creates an impact that lasts beyond the walls of our programs. So we value hard data as we continue to adapt and enhance our programs. We collect demographic information on each participant, track attendance at every program, and track repeater data. With the Loyola University evaluations I mentioned earlier, we use scientifically validated tools to measure changes in healthy lifestyle behaviors, confidence, self-esteem, and nonviolent conflict resolution. We also routinely administer satisfaction surveys to participants and caregivers to assess program effectiveness. These surveys pertain to knowledge gained and behavioral changes made related to sports health and leadership. We share evaluation results with collaborators and use the data to improve programming. For example, based on feedback from middle school participants, this year we revised the after school curriculum to provide more leadership based opportunities for middle school girls. At Girls in the Game, we believe in the power of sports to teach important life skills and promote a healthy lifestyle. We are proud to be an organization that focuses on the whole girl, having empowered over 45,000 girls through sports, health, and leadership programming since 1995. We know all girls have the pot potential to be outstanding leaders and game changers given the right tools, and I hope the importance of girl-focused programming is recognized in the development of the national strategy on youth sports. Thank you. Thank you, ladies for sharing those innovative programs with us. They sound quite exciting. So we're back to our question period. So you know the rules, five minutes for the feds, 10 minutes opened up for everybody. Be concise, say your name and organization and we'll be good to go.
No questions. We can just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> Is this on? Mm -hmm. um, Dave McCann, University of Illinois. Uh, the, um, the, the flag football program, does it require that um, adult, uh, an adult be there um, to, to be implemented? Or can the children use the, the kits and um, basically free play on their own without direct adult supervision? We primarily, we work with a large network of uh, the large majority of our, our adult leaders for our Field of the Play 60 program are actually PE teachers. So we work very closely with PE teachers to lead play. But yes, they could uh, do free play on their own. Uh, we've also did a unique program where we brought uh, Field, of, uh, Field of the Play 60 flag kits to uh, summer feeding sites and engaged AmeriCorps volunteers to lead flag. So there's, it has a lots of uh, uh, versatility. Do we have any other questions? So you don't pay through um, the supervision of the, of the program? No, we, is it back on? Hi. Uh, the PE teachers that we work with have already volunteered to be uh, adult leaders for Field of the Play 60 and to lead flag activities. Um, it's not always PE teachers, but that's the majority of them. We work very closely with Shape America, but it could be other, other teachers or volunteers within the school. Would you tell us your name, please? Okay, thank you. The one thing we do provide, though, for any volunteer to lead flag is uh, training, free training, uh, both in-person training and online training. There's th those options. We'll be doing a lot of training next week, as I mentioned. You'll be next. Hi, Francis Bevington with ODPHP. This is a question for um, Julia and Bethany. Both of you mentioned the trauma training that you provide for your coaches. And uh, Julia, you mentioned some statistics as to how many girls are impacted by uh, trauma and violence when they come into the program. Do you have a sense from the coaches for how often that training is utilized? Um, I would say it's utilized a lot in the way we deal with behavior. So of course when you have programming with any population of young kids, regardless of their background, behavior challenges come up. Um, but the trauma and strengths-based training we do comes up, with the, comes up with the way our coaches deal with behavior. So the way our the, our coaches talk to girls, um, and when coaches, you know, coaches always have to tell staff, you know, they have to report about each programming session. Um, so the way we refer to girls, we would never talk about kids as being bad. We just, you know, we we, I would say it comes up mostly in the language we use. We're similar, right? So it's not, okay, here's a moment and we're gonna intervene and then that's the tool and then you're done. It's about the way the entire program is structured. So 50% of kids in America Scores programs are girls. Close to 100% of kids in America Scores programs have experienced at least one, typically four or five on the ACEs scale, right? The adverse childhood experiences, right? These are kids who exist in high trauma environments. And so the way that our entire curricula is structured, we actually have a soccer curricula, we have a service learning curricula, and we have a poetry curricula. They're actually like books. I mean, we have them online too, but in like 150, 200 bound pages that are modeled out. But everything from the way those are written, from a positive youth development mindset to the language that we use in the curricula, when training coaches, when working with coaches, to the support. So our staff go out to fields, right? So here in DC, for example, we work in 60 schools. We have about 250 community-based coaches just in DC. We only have 15 staff in DC, permanent staff. And that staff doesn't just do programming. They do the fundraising and the you know, operational support. But we have staff out at schools and out at game days every day. And staff also report back. So we have quality standards. What does it look like? Are the coaches communicating effectively with the kids? Are we seeing positive interactions? Um, is the equipment there, right? And the equipment that we have provided, because we provide everything the kids need, the coaches need to have this. Most of our partner schools don't have goals. They don't have, like we line the fields, right? Like literally creating the environment. Um, how do the coaches respect each other? 
How do the kids, did they do a high five at the end of the game with the other team? We do a sportsmanship talk at the beginning of every game. And so this trauma-informed training is not so much of here are three tools and use them when, it's an entire how do you approach kids, how do you approach the setup of the entire experience, and then we evaluate regularly whether that's being carried through, and if we see it's not, then we go back and staff intervene to retrain. Kate and then Katrina. Oh, mm -hmm. Katrina Piercy from ODPHP. I'm curious about from like a, a marketing awareness standpoint in terms of you all, because you got many of it connected at kind of at schools. Are you finding schools are reaching out and wanting your program to come in? Are you going to schools and trying to find an ambassador that brings you all in? Can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the structure and how you've gotten to where you are? Sure. So I'll start and go down. So yes. Um, all right, so we cannot grow fast enough to meet demand. So here in DC, we have a wait list of 15 schools, which has doubled over the last six years. At the same time, we've tripled the number of kids we serve in DC over the last six years. That is similar in our other cities. The demand is there, and what happens, because of the way that we work, we are in bed with school teachers, right, and school staff, they move schools a lot in the public schools. And so they'll go to another school, we'll get a call, hey, we really want scores to come to our school because we've seen what it did at school X, we now want it at school Y. At the same time, we don't leave it to chance. So we won't go into a school building where we don't have a partnership with the principal, where we literally have an MOU sign, the principal understands why we're in the building and what we're doing. We understand the principal's goals for the building because we see ourselves, again, not as a nice to have, but as an important player in helping that school building and that school community achieve its goals, right? To that point, we go out and we recruit kids, right? So especially when we're starting new programs and really helping set the culture at that school with those new coaches, our staff are out there recruiting the kids alongside the coaches. So there's a little bit of both going out, but also incredible demand that we can't grow fast enough to meet. <laughs> are you going to go next? Uh, we, are the great, we are in 73,000 schools, so we have a great network of communications within schools, and we uh, provide what we call national offers for things like flag kits. Uh, we consistently are getting three, four times as many requests as, as we're able to fill demand, same, same thing. So uh, there's a lot of need out there, but that is how we communicate it through our schools. Yeah, so as a newer organization in Baltimore City, um, I think this has been definitely a huge focus of a, of, that we have is getting into schools. So schools in Baltimore City, a majority of them are underfunded, they don't have space, staff just have a lot on their plates. Um, so we do plenty of just walking into schools and introducing our programs and saying, here's where we are, are already, here's what we do, can you fit our programs? Um, we want to be at schools where the need is the highest, but schools that also have the capacity to hold our programs. So schools, we need to have a site contact at every school that, you know, that can work things out for the students end. Um, and we also work with programs, so for example, Project Play in Baltimore uh, works specifically in East Baltimore. So we've had meetings with Project Play where they've told us, here's schools that we, you know, that we recommend for your program that have a need for you. So I think this is where building relationships with other organizations that are as familiar or even more familiar with the cities you're in um, is very helpful. Uh, Dan Gould, Michigan State Institute for the Study of Youth Sports. Uh, obviously, you're here because you have exemplary programs, and I think you have the evaluation data, et cetera. Um, so the question I'm going to ask is negative, but it's not an indictment of the program. Have you looked at when your program fails, like a, a, a young person drops out and gets in trouble with the police, or it's not implemented correctly in a school? And what have you learned from those negative cases? Well, um, as so I was hired onto Girls in the Game to bring teen programming to, to, to Baltimore. Um, and with new programs, it brings tons of failure. It's just a part of the job. Um, so I would say failure for us right now most looks like participation and all those barriers I talked about earlier. We, I don't believe, look specifically into the reasons why girls might have dropped out of our program you know, we make calls. If girls miss our programs, we always make calls and we try and figure out what's going on. Um, but I don't think we've actually researched into things like that. Um, but I do think 
some sort of failure is a part of it. But that's why I talked about how each city is unique. So we are super, super established in Chicago at over 50 schools in Chicago. Um, and I've learned that our programs in Baltimore might not look exactly how they look in Chicago because Baltimore is its own city. It's very unique. So we're figuring out what works and what doesn't work based on the needs of Baltimore City. Based on our uh, utilization research, I think the, the things that, um, the schools that aren't as engaged or maybe they don't stay as active in our program, I think it's no surprise probably, it's that those who get funding, grant funding, are the most engaged and have the greatest impact in their school. Those who have an adult champion in the school that, that move this, the program forward, or even a youth leader, a youth champion that leads it forward among their peers. Um, those are, those are make a big difference in whether a school stays really engaged in the program or that declines. For us, it's, it's those same things. So an adult champion in the building, right? And we're really about that grassroots from within the community model and without that adult champion, it doesn't be the same person every year. Without that adult champion, things can go really awry. Uh, <clears throat> and then two is related partnership with that school building administration. It doesn't matter if some big charter school network wants us in their schools or some big school district does. If the principal doesn't understand how what we are doing after school <laughs> helps their school culture and their goals for the school, it's not gonna work. Thank you. Any additional questions? Hey, you're quiet, the after lunch crew. Um, why don't we, all the panelists for the next panel, are you in the room? Okay, you ready to go or? Okay, thank you. Thank you, ladies. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense.